time period. We are a far more diverse project. We do a lot of different things. Pretty much in the early days, we were focused on simple networking code, having good routing code, um, reasonable performance, and, and a, fairy, a fairly one of each thing, and now we, we're starting to get N, N of many things. We have, we have the pluggable network stacks. Um, just it's, it's, I can't even enumerate the different pieces of, of flexibility that we've drawn. Our, our, the code base for FreeBSD 1.0, I want to say the source code was under 32 megabytes in size. And that's what, an order and a half of magnitude larger now, um, 700 megabytes or something like that for a, for, for a source tree without SVN um, side files in it. And we actually have the vendors, we have vendors with different needs and we have volunteers with different needs. And so the project is, has gotten um, some growing pain occurring with that, I think. Um, how are we doing as a project? I really don't know. I don't have an answer for that. I'd like to hear some feedback. Um, are we doing well? Are most of the vendors happy? Um, are most of the volunteers happy? Uh, I've heard some things, but I would like to hear a whole lot more things. This is going to be a little interactive. Nobody's got anything to... We don't have system D. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> so by simply keeping one thing out of the tree, we're doing a wonderful job. <laughs> is it the lowest common denominator? I don't know. Um, there, we, we've had some, some conversations this week. Um, I've definitely been eye open to some things that I didn't know people were thinking about. Um, the, the packaging of base that's coming about is, brings some opportunity that other people may not have heard about. Um, the idea of completely replacing user land with a different user land. Um. And people didn't think we'd get rid of GCC either. <laughs> um, in the early days, you're probably right, Dan. It was always that the, the I, as the 12.0 developer summit goal, um, we've been trying to eliminate GPL, and we've been trying to do that for 25, 24 years. I think the CSRG tried to do it as well. They they had a a desire of if if there was a, another good solution that wasn't GPL. Even if it was slightly less, I'm, I'm getting a nod from Mike. It, even if it was less um, capable than the GPL version, it was quite acceptable to use the less, um, the lesser product simply because it didn't have a GPL on it. So that's been going on essentially the whole time. Um, I'm not in full agreement with some of the steps being taken to get us free of GPL, and that's simply removing functionality from the base system. But if that's the road we need to go down, Let's get down that road, because we're very close. I think we're down to 10 or 15 pieces, probably around there or so of you know, components that need to be, be replaced. The next big question is, how can we do this better? What is it that vendors want? What is it that the volunteers want to try and make this project a better project for everybody? Um, I see, and these are, all, these are the three things that I see very, very commonly, is, is we need to communicate more, we need to do more testing, and we need to do better documentation. And that's just from my perspective. I'm sure the list is much longer. Um, what can we do about communicating? We need to, within the project itself, I think we've got some communications problems going on. We've got some teams. Um, the teams internally, I think, communicate real, real well, but the communications between the different teams is a little bit lacking. We've got the release engineering team, the security officer team, cluster admin, core, um, and I, th I think that the communications between those can be better. I think it is going to get better because there's, there's obviously been brought to light that, that, that the communications uh, could be using some improvement. I'm here today trying to bring it more to light. Um, between the developers, um, I don't think we talk enough between ourselves, there's, it's, 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 it's very common in this world, we're introverts, we like to kind of keep to ourselves and work in, in a one, two, three type situation and not work with 50 other people all at once. Um, it's easier to do for most people. It's, it's hard sometimes to open up and share ideas 
with other people. And the bike sheds got blue paint on them, folks. But let's have them. Um, in the last year since I've returned to the project, I've, I've probably heard, oh, I don't want to bring that up. That'll start a bike shed 30 or 40 times in a year. That's 25 too many. There's sometimes that we just shouldn't have the bike shed. We already know it's going to be a big bike shed and we've already had it. But there's other times literally people won't bring an issue up because they're worried it's going to be a bike shed. We've got to stop doing that. We need to talk about that stuff. Um, good engineering can come out of bike sheds. Um, bad engineering can come out of no discussions. Um, bad engineering can come out of bike sheds too. And you can end up upsetting people. But I think I think if we document some things about how to do a bike shed, I think Benno is working, there's, there's a, huh? Yeah, the, FC, the FCP thing will help a lot with that process because people now have a, a formal mechanism to go, I want to start this bike shed, let's go do it. Um, and, and, and that'll be good. The other thing is our communications between the project and the vendors. I don't know how good that state of affairs is. Um, in the last year I've interacted with at least four different vendors. Some of the communications has been really good um, as far as they're concerned with the project. Some of it's been not so good. Um, there's many vendors here. If, if there's issues with that, I, I think the project needs to hear about them. I think we can do better. I hope we can do better. And we need to test. I don't, we, we are light years ahead today where we have ever been. But what we have is a little teeny bit of testing if you start looking at things. We had a hacker, uh, hacker lounge conversation the other night about how, how much test do you need. Um, we were trying to get an idea of the size of what that test code should be. Is it, is it 10 times? Do we have 10 times as many lines of code to do testing as we do lines of code we're testing? Is it five times? Is it one to one? Is it half as much? We don't know. I don't know. If anybody in, here in the room has a, a very large OS test environment that can hit all of the lines of code, I would like to see it. Even if you just tell us, yes, we have one of those inside, but nobody else can use it. Um, I come from, a, I had a pretty strong test uh, engineering background in my earlier career. I don't have solid answers to these questions. I think we need to ask them. I think we need to have some discussions about them. Um, are our current testing methodologies well documented? I haven't looked at them very closely. I don't know that. I hope they're well documented. If they're not well documented, we need to get them well documented. Test, test systems that aren't documented don't get used. Test methodologies that, that aren't documented don't get used by people. Um, and then the last point there is, is how good is our coverage? And that's a hard one to answer. It, it, coverage is about, I mean, how many lines of code do we got and are we hitting every line of code in the test sequence? or in a set of test sequences. Um, I'd be happy right now if we were hitting 2% of our lines of code in a test scenario. That would actually be, that would, that would make me think we have more testing than I think we actually do. Um, this is a huge complicated beast to test. Um, unit tests are great. How do you do systems level testing? There was a talk earlier about doing network testing. How do, you, how, do you, how do you test the network stack? How do you test the network stack for performance regressions? How do you do performance testing? In general, how do we make sure that we're not, we're not doing things to regress the performance of our system? Because we are known for having a good performing system. And there's some concerns for me that we may be slowing some things down. But if we don't have test measures that are standardized in place to ensure we don't do that, we probably will. And there are other speed up improvements going along that don't have test measurements associated with them that are long running to make sure that we can make a speed up and we can turn around and break it the next week and not realize it. Somebody spent all this work making all of these nice changes to speed something up and then somebody else came along fixing some other bug and it totally destroyed the work that was done there in, in making that performance improvement. Um, especially given the the, the diversity of the project. It's really, really easy to break something. It's hard to, fi it's hard to fix anything without potentially breaking something somewhere. And tests give us confidence that we're not doing that. Um, we have, as I mentioned, we've got the ATF. We have open ZFSZ tests, but we've got no man page for it. It's in the system. We ship it. There's no man page. 
I don't know what it does. It's there. It's called Z-Test. Um, we have, I believe the ZFS test suite sits in a branch or is in tree and unhooked. Um, it doesn't, I don't believe it currently even compiles and runs on, I don't, I'm not even sure if it'll compile on FreeBSD currently. It should do, uh, but I think I've seen people working on that. Uh, Alan Summers has, was working on that. Alan, Alan Summers was, has been working on it. So somebody's working on it, but it's not, it, it's, Huh? You some stuff okay. Okay. But anyway, that that I would like to see those tools picked up and make sure that we can we can get forward with somewhere. And basically, I'm I'm asking for resources, volunteers, somebody. Al, if Alan's working on it, let's get somebody else working with Alan and get get the code moved forward. We need it. Um, a regression in ZFS is a bad situation. Um, documentation. Um, this is a hard one. Developers don't like to document stuff. Um, I don't like to document stuff. Um, do you like to write documentation? Uh. <laughs> See ya! Yeah, it's exactly how most of us feel about documentation. Um, I do it. Good. I don't. How's that for a counter? <laughs> and that's a problem. And we just simply need to recognize that that's a problem, that developers don't like to do documents and find a way to try and work within that. Um, is what I would like to see is, to, is some way to make sure that all, every single one of our syscalls is documented and every single one of them stays documented. If we make it, <laughs> I got a big shrug out of the middle of the audience. If we make a change to something that affects a system call, we need to make sure we keep the documentation in sync. And that's, it's hard and I don't, you can, corporations and, and, and commercial software builders have, um, usually very strict policies about this thing. And for them, it's much, much easier to enforce. We're a volunteer group. You can't go shoving a whole bunch of rules down our throats. We're not going to respond well. Um, but I think we can do some work there. Um, I think we have done some work there, actually. Um, all the kernel functions. Um, this goes back to the, uh, the style nine guide that actually says that you should have a block comment before every function in a source code file in the kernel. Um, my last perusal through a large chunk of source code showed that we're a long ways from that mark. Um, I'll be lucky if, if the code was written 25 years ago, it's probably there. If the code was written 20 years ago, 50% of them are there. If it was written 10 years ago, 30%. So it gets, it gets varied. Um, kernel modules, missing man pages, not a good scenario. It's a real pain in the butt to try and figure out how to use a kernel module or what it does or how, how, to, how to put that kernel module into a static kernel if there isn't a man page for it. Um, the, the, the config parameters for the kernel don't always match the name of the module, so sometimes you have to go hunting around to figure out what config entries you need to cause a module to be static and whether it's valid to make that module static. Sys controls. Um, they actually are kind of self-documenting and they're supposed to have this uh, D option that should display a string, a descriptive string of what they do. Um, we're missing many of those. Um, and the, the, these are the non-opaque ones. These are the ones that would be returned by a simple sys controls AD. Um, I believe the opaque ones are even heavier in what they're missing as far as the, the number that are missing descriptions. It would be nice to get those strings all filled in and to find a way to make sure that we don't regress there. Once we do it, it would be nice to have something so that if we add a sys control, there's some Jenkins job or some other automated tool that goes, yep, we didn't, we, we, that sys control has a, has a descriptive string on it and, and is documented somewhere. All the ABIs and the KABIs, that's, that's a big can of worms. There's a <coughs> lot of stuff there. Um, the chapter nine, when I started, we didn't have it. And the only documents you had were these block comments and the kernel sources and stuff. So I'll say we've made forward progress there, but again, um, I think we're, there's room for improvement. Um, it may also help keep us from breaking those because if we document them as ABIs, we realize that yeah, if, if you're gonna change this, you gotta change the document too. And if we're changing the document, we're probably doing something we might not want to be doing. 
Um, I'm way ahead of schedule. Some, oh, Warren, here we go. Let's hear from the docs group. I'm going to try and repeat what Warren said there in, in, a, in a synopsis way. The, getting the mindset that, that documents are not an optional piece of a program, that they're actually part of it. When we make a change, we need to be changing the documents at the same time. Um, I'm going to go beyond that. My, um, my feeling on that is we should be writing the document before we're making the change. If we're, if we're going to change, if, if, if we're going to change a command, we're going to change some options to it or something, the first thing you should do is go find the man page for it and edit the man page to document what it is, what it is you're going to change. Then go make your programming change. If you're going to change a, a sys control or a kernel module or screw, screw around with an ABI, we sh you should go hunt down the documentation, make the changes to those documents, then make the changes to the code. Um, That you would you make the face, but I'm just saying it's the logical. That I, no, I agree that it would be nice to be able to do that. It's hard to do in a volunteer project. Maybe we can get there someday. Maybe. Actually, um, I, I get Michael first. I'm sorry, Michael. Going in the same direction. We have the policy you change something user visible if the commit is without the man page, the other developers will hunt you down. Okay, it works so pretty so, well for us. The, the part that doesn't really work is section nine. <laughs> because the users aren't supposed to be reading section nine. It, 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 um, well, of course, the, the, the point that we are always reading section nine. The, the point that we started from section nine is so far from, from complete that you are not really. Like, if you commit something without documenting in section 9, nobody will really notice because it already right. is kind of right. bad. If yeah. you commit it's something in the user visible man pages that the regular users read, people will notice immediately and scream at you. And really? Good. You're, 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 your developers are reading the commit messages that closely that yeah. they're seeing. I wish we could get there. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I would really see a, a lot of, of, of slack in that arena. Yeah, Excellent, excellent. I, 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 huh? I did, I have had a, a conversation with BAPT about how, how we can add some testing to make sure that, that if we make a commit, well, this isn't necessarily making sure that the documents get there, but we're going to try and add to the, the Jenkins run of when, it, when a commit gets made, we run some linting and some Igor, which is deep, deeper linting of the man pages whenever a man page is touched in a commit to make sure that some regressions we've had in the past don't happen. Um, hopefully clean up some, some man page stuff. Um, the, the, that's, uh, there'll be a Q&A session coming here. I've got a, a final thought about where we're at. Um, I think in time, these efforts that, that I'm proposing could fulfill the, the spirits and the policies that the uh, University of California had at CSRG. Um, I'm interested from hearing from anybody that's still around from CSRG about those, how things worked there and how well they worked. But um, given that, that they did, the job that they did with a limited set of hardware and human resources from that era, it's pretty amazing. We've got a hundred times what they've had. Um, so we should be able to do a pretty smack up job of what we're turning out as far as a product goes for our, for our downstream vendors. Now we've got a wide open question session. Warren. It's not a question, but... Uh, okay. Question, questions, answers, comments, I don't, I'm, I'm early, so we've got lots of time. A while back, uh, I discovered there was a man page review that was 
automatic, any, any change that had a man page change, I was added to that review in Fabricator. Yes. It turns out that was Fab's idea. And Thank you. Last year, we asked for more people to help with that. And we got a bunch of people. And we always need more because the, the, the difficulty is not so much with uh, markups and man pages. It's with whether features are documented or whether the explanation of things makes sense and whether they actually match reality. So please, sign up for the man page review group in Fabricator and help review. You don't have to do the, the horrible thousand line reviews I do far too often, but if you can <laughs> look at the changes and see if they make sense, if they're your area, if it's something you're familiar with, or even if the line just says, I don't know what you're talking about here, this makes no sense to me, I don't need that type of review. And that really does make a big difference. Just to complement it is automated because it uh, matches some part of the discovery design. So for just to complement the information, it is uh, fully automatic. Each time someone push a review, uh, part of the discovery this is a man page, and then bring the entire team. And uh, reviewing man pages is also important not only for the fact there is a man page, but for the wording that goes in. <coughs> it was very useful to get the feedbacks from more uh, among the others. Yeah. You have better wording, in yeah. particular for non-native people. Yeah, I, I was very, very happy to see when I first used Fabricator the fact that it did that automatically for me. I was also informed by my, my mentor that um, this neat tool called Igor existed out there that, that gave us a really nice lending function of the man pages. Very useful. Um, that can be automated. There's a lot of. Well, we, we, we talked about doing that w yeah, in the Jenkins runs. Even in the review, because in Fabricator, there is a oh. lot of link, automatic linting me mechanism that does exist. So that when you push a review, you can have this. So, so Fabricator can be set up to, to yes. do the things that we talked about doing in Jenkins for commits. Yes. Yeah, that, would be, that, that would be wonderful. Yeah. That would be wonderful to have implemented. Yeah. Because that gets it that gets it on the front end. Not everything goes through Fabricator, but at least that stuff that does. Because Fab Fabricator is just one of our external interfaces. People from outside of the project can, can that's, that's their pull request, really, um, is to submit it into, into Fabricator. Or that's one of the paths. I guess uh, Warner Losh is now actively watching our GitHub pull requests. And I don't, can, no, that's all right. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Any, any, any feedback from vendors about how we're doing? I think there's a... Well, I was going to say, you wouldn't want to call yourself a vendor, right? So Amazon here, AWS, Google, Microsoft, 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 Microsoft,
Any general? Amazon, what, how are things going? <laughs> to answer an earlier question. So Colin and I meet like once every two weeks right now, and uh, uh, we spend a lot of time talking about what it is we, we want you know, we want to see uh, together, and then Colin's been uh, sort of the inroad to commit bit and to big changes, so um, even have, including things like the simple services management system um, and we're fighting a strong battle internally to make sure that we can get other Linux turned into <laughs> a different kind of label. <laughs> but, um, but we're we have a good I think we have a, we have a good working relationship and it's been it's been fantastic. So there's lots of communication and uh, love to hear more about what you want to see as well. Right, DNA support come right along. Right, that was great. This is. Uh, Next generation networking is in place and ready to go with the ESC. Makes it a good alternative for customers. Great, wonderful to hear. We're gonna have a lot of time left. I can I, I tended to blast through the talk and there I left some material out, so going once. You're staying for the auction, going twice. Thank you all. Have a good evening. <laughs>